That music's terrible. What lurks behind this unassuming storefront in Cleveland, Ohio? It's the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft and Magic. Learn the history of Wicca and the tale of those who brought it to the United States. See the tools of magic once used by practitioners of the arcane arts. It's the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft and Magic. Welcome back to the Buckland Museum Frankenstein Radio Controls, broadcasting out of a forgotten chamber in the wilds of Ohio. Tonight, we're going to chat with Stephen P.H. on Balanced Romano about his latest show on loan here with us. It's uh, now on display in our rotating exhibit space. It's uh, called the uh, Apparition Specters, Conjures, and the Paranormal. And uh, it's pretty incredible. And to celebrate, he's gathered this rogues gallery, a motley crew of artistic visionaries, and some of the most compelling visual artists of our time. Um, but uh, first, some business. Uh, let's see. The uh, membership to the museum are going really well. Really thanks to everyone that has been ordering our memberships. Here's an example of the card that you get. Um, visit bug, uh, bucklandmuseum.org to uh, get your own. Of course, the museum uh, helps keep us afloat. You get discount on purchases, all that sort of thing. It's awesome. Um, let's see. The apparition show is free with admission to the museum. You know what? I am so excited to talk with this group here, but let's just uh, go ahead and do it. Welcome to the Buckland Museum. Woo! Thank you. Thank oh, you. Yes. So, I guess we should do a brief introduction. We have Stephen Romano here, just, just to the uh, left, right to me here. Uh, <laughs> he's got his like, Crypt Keeper outfit on. Next to him, we have Barry William Hale. And Barry William Hale has been in the museum quite a bit. Down below, we have a Lexus. All right. Catching an echo here. Somebody like that. Jump up your echo. Jump up your echo. All right. Here we have Daniel. And then over there, we have Josh. Welcome to the Buckle Museum, guys. So Stephen Romano, so tell me about the group of people that you've gathered around us here. Well, we have ladies first. We have Alexis Carl. We have Alexis Carl. Well, first of all, I must say that you know the group is together. So tight, we have the four together. The most compelling visual artist working together in my mind. Each one of them takes their practice so seriously. Um, they make art that goes to the fifth level, absolutely enlightening. And, you know, above all else, these are artists who, you know, don't seek, don't seek for their own fame. Don't seek for their own fame and their own, uh, their own sense of abundance. You know, these are artists who struggle with the most difficult of uh, enigmas that are are presented to us as human beings. These are artists who, you know, could very well, could very easily be like executives in major corporations. I mean, that's how sharp their minds are. We could very easily be artists who are practitioners as opposed to experimentalists. These are artists who take, who take the known and push it to the boundary. Push it to the boundary where we're, ex where we're exploring uncharted territories, particularly in the domain of the esoteric. And, you know, these are all intangibles that these artists work with. And they're working with tangible, they're, they're trying to 
put they're trying to translate the intangible into tangible materiality so that others other people who are seekers can cross the threshold and interact with your art and somehow come away with a sense of affirmation that seeking the esoteric and seeking the metaphysical and the spiritual, the left hand path is, is the correct path for us to evolve uh, spiritually as well. So uh, can you make me small again so I can point up the point up the ladies first, of course. Alexis Carl is uh, one of the most engaging and prolific uh, multimedia artists that I've encountered in my 30 years of being you know, in the art world, her, um, her work in film, uh, her work in installation, her work on, in uh, uh, crafting objects, um, all bears uh, an, an equal sense of, um, so the word I'm looking here, proficiency, right? That she engages with all these different mediums equally as though she has like a, a fluidity of going from, Going from one to the next, she paints as well and draws and uh, does. Oh, you want to hear fucking music, man? First time I heard her music, I thought I was listening to some unreleased Lisa Gerard material or something, but that was so much better that it just completely blew me away. And then I turn around and I see her singing live. I'm just like, oh my god, right? And she had all these. It was a Catland books. It's performance. She had all these dancers and motion and uh, her, she had an installation in the middle of it, it all just gelled together so incredibly, right? So it's absolutely my honor to uh, introduce Alexis. I think one of the most, um, one of the most important artists working in uh, the esoteric today. So. Thank you. I am, <laughs> Whew, okay, done. My what, was, what was the short version, right? <laughs> uh, also happens to be one of my best friends. You know, we've known each other what about four or five years now, and um, sure, I think now just put it off. You know, right away, and um, always keeping in touch with each other. And she's always keeping me, you know, abreast of her projects and her showings and etc. Uh, so moving right along to this side, this guy, Barry William Hale. Uh, it's coming to us from Australia. So, what time is it there in Australia? Wait, hold on. What time is it, Barry? Uh, 11 oh, a.m. You have to get uh, up maybe early, yeah. Day, right? But, yeah. Barry, no, not really. Barry is another That's one okay. who goes straight to the fifth level. I mean, uh, when I first saw his work, was through um, Fulgar. Right, that's the piece he did for the Twin Peaks show, which was just incredible. Uh, these are all shots he did from, uh, oh, a show that we all did together and uh, uh, for the Dark Moco Festival uh, in Tasmania. Just absolutely incredible. But Barry is the real deal, you know? It's like from the very first time I saw his work, it just hit, hit a nerve, you know? Hit like a, hit like a psychic nerve. And um, it's just... <laughs> Gary's like one of those conduits, you know, like, I don't know where, I don't know where he gets his energy from. I don't know. I don't know what frequency he's tuned into, but he somehow channels it. And when people see the work, they're just completely awestruck. And Barry's another one, you know, who just goes from one medium to the next, goes from performance to painting to doing these incredible cutouts that are uh, so graphic and hard hitting. But um, you always know with Barry that this is this is uh, this is genuine work. This is authentic work, and the brain, you know, is hot wired to recognize that. I think as we all go through all this ordeal called life, this trauma called life. I don't mean trauma necessarily negatively, but you know the impact that life has on us. We're hot wired to recognize authenticity, and all of, all of you have that, you know, in your art. And uh, it's, it's certainly the one thing I recognized from Barry. And we've enjoyed several successful collaborative efforts. We did this show called, uh, our first collaboration was Magic of Sexualis, a show that we curated together at my gallery in Brooklyn that was voted number one esoteric event, I think, by Spiral, Ma some Spiral Magazine, or what was it? Or had the cops raided the opening, I remember that. So that was incredible. Um, then we have Danielle Juan Calves from Portugal. What time is it there? You're not in Lisbon. Where are you in Portugal? Uh, 
Delayed reaction. I'm in Porto. I'm in Porto. Porto. That's north of my Porto. country. Yes, Porto. Right. So Daniel, it's uh, about two, 250 miles from Lisbon. Oh, just walking. Distance. And it's uh, quarter past midnight. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> so here we see examples of Daniel's work. Daniel. Yeah. Extremely uh, tremendous exposure in the last couple of years, having features in Raw Vision magazine and the, the next one that's coming out, the Alchemy, the Heart of Alchemy magazine, and um, everywhere you go, it seems that uh, you see Daniel's work. You now you go to the Outsider Art Fair, and there's like three booths that feature Daniel's work. You know, and um, the work itself is like so meticulous and so um, tenacious. You know, for like a these are all hand drawn. Okay, this isn't done with like those spirograph things or whatever. Each one of these marks is hand drawn, and Daniel immerses himself into these works and really doesn't come out until it's finished, right? <laughs> and when you see these in the flesh, you get an overwhelming sense of uh, pathos, you know, that the attempt to actually uh, aspire to these heights is, uh, and, 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 and to, um, and to claim that territory victoriously once you get there. Uh, it's nothing sort of astonishing, you know. I've had several works of Daniels in my collection, and um, they're always some of my favorite things, you know. That's, uh, you look at them, and they're awe-inspiring. Ab absolutely incredible and awe-inspiring. And, you know, don't don't kid yourself. Daniel is, Daniel is going to be a major star in the art world. I, I just know it, and I feel it, and I'm never wrong about these things. I've never been wrong. Uh, he's collected, he's in some incredible collections. Um, uh, the Brooklyn Artist Cause, he's a uh, big collector of his work. He's in the uh, Saint Antoine collection. Is that how you say it? The Saint Antoine collection in Portugal? Major collection of visionary art. Um, practically every collector of, uh, a serious collector of outsiders, self thought visionary art, uh, has his work or is considering getting it at this point. So, it's very much our pleasure to be accompanied by Daniel. And last, but certainly not least, one of my favorite people walking the face of the fucking planet, Josh Devon. You know, what can you what can you say about Josh? You know, it's like his art is uh, nothing sort of astonishing. This is someone who, you know, I'll risk sounding corny here, right? But this is someone who, you look at his work, and it's so sublime, in the truest sense of the word. It's so sublime and so beautiful, and it just radiates love, right? And what greater aspiration and what more noble pursuit can you possibly have as an artist than to share that you know, the world, right? Put that into the world. It's like everything this guy touches seems to be... Um, you know, first of all, you know, when you're looking at a work of art, I mean, I've, you know, I've talked to this about Susan before, you know, there has to be the technical proficiency. The artist has to be, you know, either approaching or mastering their craft, right? They have to be in control. They can't let the craft control them, right? And, you know, I don't particularly believe in that. I know there's other schools of thought on that, right? But Josh is absolutely one of the best draftsmen that I've ever met. In fact, uh, when we had the Twin Peaks show on, which all four of these artists were in uh, last October, Josh stayed with us, and uh, my kids had the honor of having a drawing lesson by Josh. Right? It was just—it was just absolutely incredible to see what goes into the work, technically. Um, but then you also have to—you know—the second part is you have to have a vision. You know, you have to have a vision of the world that you want to put out there, that you want to perpetuate or you want to articulate. Right? The art has to be about something. Right? And Josh is always right on there. But then the most important part is the third part, it's the execution. It's how the technique, how the vision expressed itself to the actual making of the work, right? 
And this is, I think, where Josh is um, enters the realm of the sublime. It's, it's the work itself, you look at it and you can't, you, you cannot possibly preconceive of the effect that it has on you. You know, just the way he handles the graphite and the way he delves into the details and how he, how we see the world through his eyes, you know, so absolutely beautifully. So uh, always an honor to have Josh and um, someone who's ended up being a very good friend to me. So um, all four of you are so important. And to have you here on the same screen, ready to rock and roll. Yeah, these are the Twin Peaks drawings he did, which, uh, it was, uh, if I may say so, I think I'm okay saying this. It was Sabrina Sutherland's birthday uh, last week and uh, she's the executive producer of Twin Peaks and we gifted her, uh, we don't actually have a picture of it here, I don't think, but we gifted her the uh, drawing Josh did of her and she was absolutely overwhelmed and overjoyed to have it. And uh, Josh has done some other people. He did Matt Dillon and uh, Matt Dillon got the portrait. And uh, I can't think of anybody else offhand, but Josh does, uh, Josh nails it every time, don't you? So you're all too modest. You're all too modest. So Stephen, you've gathered this group of people here around, and I have some questions for uh, all of them. And uh, I think I'm going to start. I'm going to ask it to all of them, but I'm just going to go around. Um, Barry, what? What does esoteric art mean to you? Like, when you think of esoteric art, is there anything that comes to your mind? Is there anything that you're playing off of? Or is it just kind of something that you know for your own personal gnosis? Well, I think for me, um, my art's always been sort of integrated <clears throat> with my um, esoteric practice. I suppose, you know, um, Say the sort of definition of esoteric means um, sort of inner rather than exoteric, which would sort of be, and usually has the implication. It, it has, in some senses, some uh, connotations that I'm not like quite happy with in the sense of like, um, uh, I think it was kind of like, uh, if, well, if you look at sort of generally sort of um, religious or spiritual traditions, um, for example, like you'll have an esoteric or a more mystically orientated aspect of uh, religion and your or spiritual spirituality, and you'll have an exoteric, which would be sort of more like, you know, like the church or, you know, the outward sort of form. And I suppose the esoteric sort of is sort of looking at the sort of the spiritual kernel of these traditions, and usually they're kind of a little bit more, I like them sort of more marginal, and they sort of really go to the heart of the matter. So say in Islam, you'll have like the Sufi mystics or something. So there'll be a sort of a, um, and I think that mystics always been problematic um, to more orthodox or heterodox, you know, it, it's a more heterodox kind of like mode because they make their, they establish their own relationship with their inward journey or, you know, like, um, and so it's a more like a kind of a direct kind of, revelation or gnosis which is problematic i suppose to the power brokers but um just generally i think uh esoteric uh, for, for me my art's always been integrated with my um occult uh process and um so the art is really like an outgrowth or a residue of an ongoing kind of esoteric process and personal work so which begs the question did the art create the occultist, or the uh, occultist create the art? Then, well, I mean, if you were, if you, were, it's sort of like the artist is, you know, usually within a sort of like, um, if you you look at like, say, what Blavatsky would say or Crowley would say about the um, the artist, is they're kind of like a little bit of an inversion of the um, the, the the sort of the the occult process, which is sort of like mining back into the sub uh, to into the unconscious where. The artist uh, has a kind of like, for them, and I, I, I don't know that I would sort of buy this, but for them, you know, it's sort of the artist is kind of like, you know, the tip of the volcano where the unconscious kind of, you know, the artistic process or the expression sort of taps into where I suppose a lot of those esoteric orders and the cult, cultists are trying to kind of get to. 
if, if you know what I mean. I don't know if that's kind of clear or not. So is it the, 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 the what was the question again? Is it the occultist making art or the artist? Uh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I mean, which came first, I guess, the chicken or the egg? Well, I mean, for me, they're, they're co-determinants, isn't it? co-determinants, you know, that they, mm -hmm. they, they, there's no real separation for me. And I suppose that sort of like, um, in a sense, put me in a pre precarious pr a place in my artistic career because um, it doesn't really buy into what would have been, you know, um, the art artistic canon until recently, really, where they're looking at sort of innovations uh, um, and rewriting kind of, you know, the canon of modern art, you know, with people like Hilmar F. Clint, Georgina Horton, I mean, they would acknowledge the, you know, um, Kandinsky and stuff. So these major transitions would sort of seismically shift sort of, you know, artistic movements like abstraction, for example, um, you know, like, um, you know, Kandinsky will, you know, uh, you know, took his inspiration from, you know, um, theosophy. And uh, you can see that in his um, sort of, you know, artistic manifesto, so to speak. But I think we're in a really interesting, and it's really interesting at the moment because I think with the kind of the popularity of like um, the Hilmar F. Clint show, who I've been a fan of, and, uh, you know, these marginal kind of women artists are really rewriting and coming to the fore and rewriting what it's, it's, a, it's a reappraisal. So I think it's a really exciting time, but my position of kind of, you know, um, talking about uh, my kind of more explicit occult uh, inspiration and it part of my um, you know my practice really hasn't sort of fit well within the uh, four walls of the hallowed halls of artistic <laughs> discourse if so to speak but I think that's changing I I have to say that I love your art I love to be able to share it with the world so next up Josh so Josh welcome to the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft and Magic so do you consider yourself, let's see here, having a hard time catching your audio here. So let's head over to Daniel here until we figure that out. So Daniel, welcome from Portugal. You are a mystic. You have to be. I look at the art and I see it within you. Where did this all come from? What was your first piece of the S of, well, he's gone. So now back to Josh. So Josh, can you hear me? Do you have anything to say, Josh? Yeah, I can hear you. The microphones right. are a little rough. All right. Um, about what? So welcome to my art. Yeah. So where does this come from? Is it like an esoteric bend, or is it just something that like comes out of you and you can't stop it? Uh, yeah, it, it's a. Uh, it comes out of me pretty much. I can't stop it. It's probably a an early early age um, subconscious want to rebel against uh, organized religion. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Being that I live in the buckle of the Bible Belt, so. Yeah, you live in Can Kansas, right? No, Oklahoma. Or right, no. even Oklahoma. <laughs> I knew the son of your ex-mayor like 20 years ago. So, um, but that's not really a fun, exciting story. I just think it's kind of wild. So, welcome back, Daniel. Welcome back. I don't know what the fuck happened with this connection. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I mean, you are on the other side. So, we broke down. So, Daniel, oh, you're cross-examining Josh. Okay. And then, yeah. yeah. So, Josh, so what's yes. the first piece of like, esoteric art you ever discovered? Do you have any memory of this? A moment where you saw things and you're like, this is you're like, your inspirations would have been. In your formative stages, uh, Stephen, I'm having a real hard time hearing what you said. Oh, I said the microphone is. Oh, I said, 
I said, what would have been like your influences or your uh, inspirations when you were in the formative stages of being an artist? Like, did you look at Dolly or Escher or Bruegel or Geronimus Bosch? Or what was it that inspired you to think that, oh, you know, this is, this is something, you know, this is something maybe I want to dedicate my life to? Yeah. Um... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess you could say that. Yeah, I always appreciated all those artists and things like that. But um, I guess it was just a, it was more of a, an escapism for me to, to do. I hope I'm answering your question. No, no, you're doing fine. The yeah. microphones are really. I can hear okay, you. Okay. Uh, it's, it was an escapism because uh, my childhood was so shitty and so. I started just doing art and things like that, and I've always just been um, more drawn to, to darker things, you know. And there's also a, a satisfaction in knowing about those things that, that scare a lot of quote-unquote regular people, especially where I live. And it's like <laughs> kind of a, a sick pleasure whenever they are scared of something that's not familiar to them. So... You That's know. you. Uh, but uh, it's what keeps me sane, pretty much. Right. And when you dedicate yourself to when you dedicate yourself to making an image, do you have like a preconceived notion of you know of pretty much how it's going to turn out before you start, or do you kind of go on an odyssey with the piece itself and let it evolve through the process of making it? Uh, more so than anything, the the whole idea process of it and just putting it together in my head takes way longer than the actual product, way longer because I like to do a lot of research and things like that, and um, it just uh, I like to formulate it in my head, and then the actual putting it on paper and everything it it goes pretty fast, especially if it's something I'm committed to i guess so about the best way i can put it right and then i i saw on um it was either facebook or instagram the other day and this is something i didn't know that you don't actually usually tend to make the drawings in your home you go out to the bars yeah, yeah. and make it yeah. so you must be surrounded yeah. with like some spectators who look at you and I mean, obviously, uh, they, you know, a lot with all due respect, you're like a fish out of water over there, right? I mean, you're kind of in, like you said, you're in the middle of the Bible Belt, yeah. and you're making these, like, you know, aggressively yeah. demonic images. And what do they, what do they think? Like, what do, do they ask you? Oh, what are you doing? Or do they have an opinion before they even bring me into that space a little bit? Because that's oh. something I don't see. Well, I mean, I. I don't know what I don't know how that started honestly like I I uh I did things at home and then for some reason I just wanted to be I I've worked in bars for oh almost 10 years and so I kind of oh, just got that. used to it and um but uh, uh many of the people who who know me somewhat here they they know to stay their distance whenever I'm sitting in the corner drawing with my headphones on or something like that but uh you know, or, or they'll come up to me if they ever do talk and they uh, ask for some shitty tattoo design or something crazy. I don't know. They try to fit it into their own uh, ecosystem. Yeah, right? I mean, uh, if I'm working on something, a lot of people don't know how to, a lot of people around here don't know how to interpret it at all. Like, I just have to they tell can't them it, I know. books. You know, I just, I don't have a response to it. There's no culture here, so. But do they have any sense that you're like, let's be modest and call what? you like a nationally recognized artist, right? I mean, you've shown all over the country and been in major shows, well, had your art reproduced in the fucking well, Observer. You know, it's like. I mean, it, it's wonderful. It's great. But what's funny that where I live, though, is I could scream from the mountaintops that I've got something showing in New York or something like that, and people won't care. But they'll oh. care if it's at an antique mall or something like that around town. 
You know, no, I... that's how strange it is. Like, they think I've made it in the art world if it's hanging in a coffee shop here in town. You know, no, and I wish that was the case, but it's not. <laughs> Well, that's beautiful. Uh, I, I want to film that someday. You sitting in the, you working in the bar and these, you know, not to, not, not to dismiss, you know, the intellectual capacity of these people that are in the bar too much, but, um, yeah. you know, it's, just, it's something oh, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah. You know, Francis Bacon used to do that as well, right? He would go to the bar and scribble on napkins and, make these drawings and people would be like, Oh, what are you doing? Oh, what is that? Oh, my kid could do that. You know, meanwhile, it's like yeah. they would you know, try to categorically dismiss it in a way, but the artist as a, uh, a shamanic presence in a bar, I think is, is great. I think that's absolutely great. There, there was this, uh, I mean, there was there a, a be bouncer any that I knew at a bar who actually was pretty intelligent who told me that he thought I was the reincarnation of uh, Toulouse-Lautrec because <laughs> he would go to, you know, yeah. And because I'm so short and all of the shit went together and he said that, you know, oh, well, you're doing pictures of these, you know, girls that are dancing or this and that. And I've always kept that in mind. So I thought, well, if he could do it, then I could do it. But I wish I was in France with, you know, Lovely ladies, and not around here with uh, <laughs> the not we all so do. lovely ladies. <laughs> we all wish we were, we all wish we were in France right about now. Oh, but, but they're on lockdown or something, right? So um, yeah, but not Australia, Barry. Yeah, we're doing we're doing really good. Yeah, it was a it was a pretty um extreme. Like, couldn't really go more than five kilometers for outside of the the house um once a day for five months but it, you know it had a good effect <laughs> and for yeah, me i don't mind being i don't yes. mind being locked down it's my it's my preferred mode of being you know <laughs> yeah. well we had a shout out here from tamara von forslin from australia saying hello Stephen, and well sure she's saying hello to everyone else as well so um uh, welcome back so let's uh, let's hear about your uh, mystic art. Mystic art. Which one? Oh, uh, I. We we changed. I think. Now, Alexis That's is right, right on the center. Yeah, but you know, you pop in with the black Yeah, but you know, you pop in with the black I don't know what's going on with the mic. We I can't can hear, I can't hear it properly. Not anymore. Oh, well, I cursed it. How about Alexis? Can you sing a song? <laughs> can, we, can we hear you? You always want to hear oh, yeah. me okay now. So Alexis, I have a question for you. Absolutely. You grew up in a graveyard? Is that what I heard? I knew that Stephen was going to say that. I, I did. The first time I, I heard of this. I, <laughs> no, I no, you knew the, this. The, um, the museum telling me, my, and she was just like, I heard she grew up in a graveyard. That's wild. Because, because her yeah. friend grew up with me. So, and he's amazing. Oh. Um, and so basically, uh, my my father, it's very interesting. When I was young, my father was president of a this big association of cemeteries, and he, which which meant that his office was at the top of the cemetery, a very very big old Victorian cemetery, kind of like Greenwood Cemetery here in New York City. So it was really quite beautiful, very old, um, late 1800s or rather mid to late 1800s. Then my mother had an antique store right inside of the cemetery gates on the bottom of the hill. And so every day after school, I would go with her to the cemetery and spend like four or five hours on the weekends. Um, and I, it was about, it was a walk from my house, like a five minute walk from my house. So um, 
until I was about 13. And so, you know, we, it just was very normal for me to, to be in that, that kind of environment. And it was never taboo or scary, um, you know, and especially at a time, I don't know what Stephen's showing for me, um, especially at that time, you know, I think I grew up in a, in an area with girls, prep school girls, and they were all like, oh, you have to hold your breath when you go by a cemetery. And I was like, well, that's really not gonna work for me. But it informed me, or rather informed my work a lot, um, because I really spent most of my time doing either grave rubbings. That was like my first artwork ever with grave rubbings with my crayons. I would write stories and notes and I'd read them on the graves to the different names you know like and i write a whole story about their lives and um so i had a really rich imagination that was inspired by the cemetery itself and so I, you said grave robbings and at first i thought you said grave robbings and i was like no, no, not grave robbing. that was later no. <laughs> I'm not um so I want to say that this is the kind of behavior that informs this kind of work right here, which is really stunningly beautiful. Thank you. Those two pieces are actually human skulls, and they were given to me. Um, so I didn't grave rob them, <laughs> but they were. Mm -hmm. No, I, I didn't mean to imply that idea. I, know. Maybe I don't know. Stephen and I showed them, I showed them with Stephen at a, two different exhibitions and we were really worried about the response actually about using these, you know, the human skulls. But the whole point of them was to revitalize them and show them in another light, um, to give them an element of beauty that otherwise they would have just been lost and desiccated as they were actually found in two different art school closets, just totally ripped apart. I mean, one of them was in pieces and I just very, Took me months, and I just put it back together, and then I started embedding them with these these stones. Okay, I was wondering if you grew the crystals upon them, or if they were embedded. No, these are, these I are really beautiful. Thank you. And are these here, which uh, so these are resin pieces. <clears throat> okay. So, so the bases are resin, but all the stones are I like for these two. It's obsidian and. Um, mahogany obsidian and smoky quartz and formalin yeah. so the, and charcoal and blood so you know uh, for me the act of embedding of these works becomes very ritualistic in its own right and i know you were talking about you know before and barry was so eloquent about that that where you know the path of esoteric at the esoteric within the art and for me the the creation itself is that part it's it's this very ritualistic aspect where, you know, I'm 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 a musician as well and a filmmaker. And so, you know, I'm composing in my head while I'm embedding, and then sometimes I'll stop and working on the skull and I'll compose. <laughs> you know, because because I know it has to go together in some way. Um, or I, I'm a perfumer as well, so I, you know, I'll create a scent that makes sense with it as well. And I, I, it, you know, the, the skulls are infused with the scent. So, you know, it all kind of works together, but it's really that in-between place um, where you're working and there is this, it's almost like in between the raindrops, you know, when you're you're kind of like, you're in this in-between place and you're swirling around and this is where all this is happening and there's a ritualism within that that I'm personally fascinated by that I think somehow links back to my childhood and those wanderings in the cemetery. So, do you remember the first um, piece of art that you saw that was like arcane or occult beyond the cemetery, or was that kind of like that was really the seed, and you went from there? Well, it's funny because I never thought of anything in the cemetery remotely being occult at all, or, or even even though I, I thought there were ghosts, and I was kind of you know talking to whomever uh, I would find on the graves. Um, I, I just didn't, I, it was just normal. And so art artistically, if I was gonna think back to that, it was probably more performance for me and music. So, you know, I, I think it was, um, I think it may have been, was it Gorecki? It was one of the pieces, like a Gorecki piece that I listened to, a Penderecki 
piece from 2001, um, you know, from various films, sounds and music that really, I, for me, were this kind of portal into something that linked into it, the occult concept or, I, 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 get, I don't like to say that very often, um, the esoteric concept, you know, again, that in-between place, looking into the shadows and figuring out how to manifest that into an artistic or musical or filmic you know, or, or a factory manner. Kind of digging around the liminal space. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But then, you know, that's where the artist resides often, I think. And then it's the opposite when it's finished. You know, you're, and as Stephen said, you know, I've done a lot of work with Stephen where I do installations of performances, and and that's the opposite. It's there's there's there, there's no in between there. You are on stage and singing and performing, and there's dancers, and then you know there's physical physical pieces that people are touching and using as um, maybe even using as spell work, like pools and spell work. You know, so there's a different it's a totally different, there's a physicality that happens and um, a presence that is its, its own thing. You know, it's very performative, I find. So anything coming up? Uh, film, I do. I've, I've been really focusing a lot on film and music at the moment um, for, for this, this pattern of <laughs> her lovely COVID moments. Um, and so I've been filming a lot. I know as, as the mask goes back up, I knew that was gonna happen, Stephen. Um, and I actually have uh, quite a few film festivals that some of my newest work is in. So I've been really oh, cool. working out a lot and um, filming, I'm filming tons right now. So even through all this, I'm going out and filming in very dystopian landscapes and working with dancers and actors. Yeah. And you know, embodying that, that part. So, Daniel, you're back. I'm back. I'm back. Finally, finally, uh, after like three or four times, I don't know what what the hell is going on. And you sound good. Yeah. No way. Yeah. So, welcome to the Buckle Museum of Witchcraft and Magic. How's well, the thank you for the privilege of showing my drawings there, and thanks oh, to it. Stephen Romano as well, and all the people including this uh, talk, Alexis and Barry and Josh, that I really appreciate their work. Um, I mean, I, I started this series of work about four years ago. Um, at, at some point, the person that started to indicate to me or making the reading of the work, because sometimes we, we, we're just so involved with it that we can't see what we are doing. And um, Stephen, it's a huge contribution in terms of, of um, he told me a funny thing lately. It's, it, it's, um, it means uh, nothing and it means everything. And it started to make sense to, to, to some of the patterns that I use and, and, um, and some of the, of the things that I've been doing lately, like th this one, yeah, that I, I was included in the Twin Peaks show. Um, uh, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I'm not really a great um, talker, let's say. I'm, I'm more like a, a guy that is always embedded and involved with his work. And, um, and, and this thing with the COVID, staying at home was a privilege for me because that's the thing I like to do. Uh, I don't, I don't want to sound like I'm stealing this from Barry, but that's, it worked for me perfectly because I'm all, hours and hours involved in this. And uh, I, I was actually working, I mean, before, before I came in. So oh, wow. there's a, a, new, a new big drawing coming up. So it's right here while I'm listening to others oh, speaking and, and, and while I'm talking, I keep on looking at it um, to see what's missing, where it's going, I don't know. And, um, so may I yes? ask you a question? A question, all right. So your work is very much um, in the tradition or in the tradition of uh, what I call mm -hmm. sacred geometry. You know the uh, 
what's her name there? The prince that I sold there. The Olga Probes and the Clint, uh, Jacob Bone, and all that work. I mean, do you feel like uh, you're you're perpetuating that aesthetic, or are you just coming at it completely differently, almost as a conduit in a way, and you just make what you make, and it comes out the way it does, and there's no real art historical reference to it. I, I didn't really look at, at, at those artists that you're talking about. I only started to look for them when you told me that it reminds me of uh, reminds reminds you of something. Um, I, I don't. Um, how can I say, how can I put this? Uh, I, I started drawing exactly with with no idea what what's coming out. I just like it's like a puzzle to me um i i it's like adding bits that in the end uh, somehow unexpectedly works that's that's the way i feel it I, I i i'm not really involved in any philosophy or continuation of 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 a certain tradition or, or something like that i don't see myself in those terms right so but an uh, artist like again uh, francis <laughs> An artist like Francis Bacon, for instance, he overtly said that he wanted to paint the scream in the same way that Monet paints the sunset, right? There was like, um, mm -hmm. say, you know, there was like that ghost behind him that he was, he mm -hmm. was trying to articulate, you know, his, the own, he was trying to articulate the influences that he so deeply absorbed within himself and have it come out in his work, right? So... Mm -hmm. where, did the, where did it start for you in a way? Okay, so Francis Bacon called that horizontal thinking, right? Is that instead of thinking laterally, you just dig a hole here and see where it goes to, right? In your instance, what was your departure point? Were you somehow, and I don't mean this in the mystical sense or the, the Ouija board sense, but were you channeling something? Where, where was it coming from? What was the voice that was speaking to you that you were the conduit for? Yeah. Is that? I mean, I make drawings as I, I, I kind of know myself. But th but then I, I I stopped for several years. I don't. I, I guess I was just busy. I, I was a waiter. I was a, a barman. Um, and um, some uh, somehow I didn't find the 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 time needed to um, to continue. But at some point from. Uh, between 2011 and 2016, I haven't done a single thing. Um, haven't started a new new drawing or painting for the for that matter. And um, um, when I went back, um, I went back like in a like in a in a <clears throat> in a basic way. Uh, I, I thought the best way to do this probably is to. Uh, pick up a pen and a piece of paper and go really back to basics. Um, and that's when this all started to come out from February 2016 after um, my, my life was kind of a mess. And, um, and I started it, uh, or let's say restarted it. And um, it's been like this, uh, initially mostly black and white, and now I, I insert a bit of color sometimes. Um, I don't know. I don't know where it's heading, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I don't know if this exactly if, if this a actually answers your question, but yeah. very, very much. That's a very good. Um, that's, that's very insightful in terms of your uh, your practice and your vision and your um, and your uh, what it what it is you're poking at. You know, what is your um, the ground, the higher ground that you're trying to attain, um, which I think is very beautiful. I think that all three, I think all four of you, um, for me, embody that sense of pathos. You know that uh, to to aspire to reach a higher consciousness, or and I don't, I don't mean that necessarily, but the the, the aspiration to reach uh, a higher order, whether or not we succeed isn't actually the object of the exercise. It's the attempt. It's the attempt that's awe-inspiring and very beautiful. Um, so 
I mean, all, all of you share that equally. So. Why don't we ask if uh, each one of them has some kind of uh, summation or some kind of, um, how do we say, you know, like what, I don't want to say what advice would you give to emerging artists? Because that's, you know, almost trite in context to the, to the magnitude of the subject and the material that you're dealing with. But, you know, what are some, of, what would be some of the cautionary, um, what, what would be some of the cautionary, I don't want advice, I guess, that you would give to artists that are, you know, trying to go on the left-hand path? Barry, do you have any idea or? Cautionary advice for people to <laughs> aspire to be artists no, or artists. people no, working artists with, to deal uh, with the subject matter like is there is there a certain not well you know uh, i mean personally you know i've probably you know similar to josh in some respects um i've naturally been sort of you know uh attracted to you know aspects um, that other people would uh, find, um, you know, uh, challenging or a little bit scary or something. But I think fear is the forerunner of failure. And ultimately, you know, I mean, I think you're only really confronted with yourself. And um, I suppose that, you know, there's, there's, there's some places that people don't want to look inside. and they, But I think it's really important um, to... Uh, to sort of, you know, like um, to go there, to, 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 and I think uh, just another point on the esotericism, I think, um, you know, for me, I, I think it's always been about exteriorizing and interiority. And I think the esoteric, I mean, you know, in that, in that context, it's like a deep dive and, um, and also similar to um, Josh as well. I think, and I think um, is that there's a, there's a compulsion or there's um Kind of like, um, you, I mean, there's the, uh, yeah, there's a, I mean, I just can't stop making art, you know. It's a, it's a curse. I, I, I advise everyone not to do it. It's a, <laughs> but don't do it with any expectation, you know. I mean, I don't think, I think it's an affliction, you know. People, I, I think people that are, you know, like uh, artistic like that, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's hard, um, and. Um, it's, uh, you know, and, and, and you have to sort of, you know, uh, step aside sort of what I suppose cultural expectations of what success and, and, and all of that stuff is. It's, it's not an easy one. It's like, you know, you know, Josh said he worked in bars and, uh, so did, and, and so, and, and so did, uh, Daniel. And, and that's the same with me, you know, like I, I worked as a, as a doorman. I mean, you know, you, you know, it's not always easy and it's all, I think, and also, Sometimes um, I, I think everyone, all of the artists represented here, are, 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 are kind of um, have a particular kind of uh, differences in, but you know, in their um, method and approach. And um, but uh, I, I would say, like you know, just just generally, I think that um, I think it goes back to Levi or something. You know, that which is holy is sometimes, you know, where's where's a you know a uh, uh, a, a horrendous mask, uh, you know, to keep away the profane. So if you're scared of it, then, you know, maybe it's not for you. If you're courageous, um, then go with it. If you have the compulsion and happen to be, have the affliction of being an artist, it's like being, I suppose, like, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, it's like a bittersweet gift that you, you don't really have a choice. Um, so I'd say probably don't do it, but if you you're going to do home. it, go all the way. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. You know, it's uh, yeah, it's a blind. Alexis. Thing. Well, it's a great question for me because I am a professor of art <laughs> at that institute. So shout out to that institute. Um, so you know, and I I get asked these questions about uh, direction and art, and and because of what I specifically teach was this installation and with a, a mark of olfactory, so scent. So we talk a lot about ritual. And, um, you know, I'm, I always, and I'll say what I say to my students, I, I always say research and dive deeper. So if you have the interest and you have the, it's not even about the skill, 
you know, first it's the interest. It's the like, well, it, there is a, it's kind of the obsession, right? As artists, we see things in a different way. As esoteric artists, we see things in a very different way. Often it's being able to look at like what Barry said, the kind of the scarier part or look into the shadows, look, don't be scared to look into those shadows. And maybe that's something that's psychological, social, um, historical, and find the medium or mediums that help you define what you find there. Beautiful. I practice that. No, no, <laughs> no, no, but I, I but I'm sincere, I'm very sincere about that. Makes me want to make, want to make art again. What you just said. Yeah, and I, I don't think it's an affliction. I, I think it is. Sure, there's an obsessive aspect. I think to, in sense, to do art and do it all the time, right? Over all these years, and we do it, and we do it, and we do it. But there's also a. It's like breathing. It's a breath right? It's like you take in all this information and all this, some of it's just awful, right? You take in all the shit that's going on right now and the difficulty and the trauma and you spit it back out into something that you've created. Um, and perhaps sometimes other people look at it and they go, my God, you're giving me a moment of pause. Or, you know, I see Daniel's work and I'm like, oh, I'm right. I'm like, and Barry and Josh too. I'm right into this, like, this almost meditative space, looking at their work, um, you know, and I'm, I'm hope I hope that's the same with me, or perhaps it's just it, just, you know, quickens you a little bit, or it wakes somebody up, um, and I think that that's part of it. And I, Stephen and I, we've talked, you know, we've talked about this, Stephen Romano, and I've talked about this so many times. It's like, you know, let's wake these people up. Let's 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 look inside this other part that people can have associate with fear or associate with prejudice. I mean, you know, I'm coming from being a scholar of ancient texts like grimoires and as well as the witchcraft trials, you know, and it's like you start to see hand in hand, you know, as soon as the artist or is, is asserting the power in this occult element, you know, you also have a whole stream of naysayers so it's going up against that and at the same time it's showing a different pathway for young artists and i think that that's very exciting josh do you want to add anything to that i mean from your particular um from your particular vantage point it's a little bit it's a little bit um more raw and real life experience you know, how, for instance, we were talking about how you draw on the bar and, you know, you're in a particular, yeah. you're in an ecosystem, I think, that um, ben benefits in a way uh, that it's, you know, Not friendly. it's non-academic. <laughs> friendly ecosystem. <laughs> well, I... I definitely want to say that I agree both with what Barry said and with what Alexis said. And, um, uh, uh, boy, that's a tough question. It's making stuff for me is just, it's cathartic for lack of a better term, but no, it's perfect. You have to be, there has to be a certain level of um, courage in you to do, to go, as Alexis said, into, you know, these darker spaces. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are terrified of that, of, of their own inner self, of how raw or dark they may be in their conscience. And they're, they're terrified of it. And heaven forbid they try to expel something to create something in the world that mirrors that. And, um, I, when people ask me about my artwork or something like that, I usually just say it's a blessing and a curse, and they they understand why it's a curse, and because it it is, uh, it's so thing you just can't you can't turn it off. You're compelled to do it, and um, it's 
you know, I mean, it, I don't, I don't know what else to say, honestly, about it. It's just something that I've always done. And I think that that's just going to be the way it is until my, until my left hand gives out on me and I can, I can do it. But, uh, and also though, too, <laughs> Yeah, but it's, uh, well, you know, my, my upbringing was, uh, I, I always go back to stupid childhood stuff, but, you know, I was, I had a lot of uh, medical problems, things like that when I was a kid, a lot of broken bones, things like that, and um, that all has, now I see, it, it's, it's translated into my artwork, you know, things like that, and maybe it's my fear. What happened to me when I was younger, coming out? But artists that start out or have any eyes for them, I guess, just don't be afraid of criticism. I know that sounds cliche, but don't do what you love, pretty much. Uh, that's that's beautiful. As simple as I could put it. And don't do no, it. No, it's very <laughs> Don't pay them. <laughs> and I love you guys. You it off oh, we love you too, man. I love all of you. I I know I was just thinking yeah. that, you know, that all of you uh like I said a little bit before, you know, I alluded to, you know, like the bottom line for all for all of you is to put out pos positivity into the world, to to contribute to the spirit of humanity, to uh, in a, in a grand way, not in a small right. cliche token way, in a learned way, I guess we call it, but to explore new territory. Um, and, and, and bring that to fruition uh, so that other seekers see your art and have, have the affirmation, you know? Nonverbal, but the body feels it, you know? Have, have that affirmation that um, the light is there if you look for it and do the work necessary to uh, absorb it properly. Um, but also has to be said that having yourself and Steven, the two, the two of you Steven. championing work like ours is the way that it's able to be seen and able to be relevant, well, understood as relevant within a world that possibly would not have seen it as such. So having you champion, champion it <laughs> um, on so many different levels from, you know, something like this, the artist talk to the exhibition that we're in the moment to the various um, avenues that you've both presented work in this ilk has been, is so important for us as artists. I got to Give Alexis um, William Mortensen for Christmas. There we go. <laughs> you didn't know that that's, that's what I was going on right now. I'm like, uh, I need another. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm serious. <laughs> and just on that note, speaking strictly for myself, of course, I can't speak for, wait, where is he? Steven. But uh, being a presenter is an honor. You know, we talk about the artist's gift being a blessing and a curse. As a presenter, it's but a blessing. I mean, it's only a blessing to be able to um, somehow take this work and disenfranchise it and putting it uh, in the forefront, putting the integrity of the art and the artist in the forefront, you know, particularly with you guys, right? And doing a show like the Apparition Show where I'm juxtaposing you with, you know, masters, you know, like the Co the Colo and the William Hopes and the, you know, so on and so forth, right? But putting you in putting you guys in context with that work that's of, you know, tremendous historical significance. And, but, but having it go toe to toe with that work as well, you know, letting it on its own terms and it's of, of its own uh, fruition, go toe to toe with this other work and become um, attaining an equilibrium by contextualizing the contemporary and the historical. Um, I think that speaks volume. Uh, 
not only for your capability, but for the uh, level of success and accomplishment that you achieve in the art. So uh, what can I say? It's an honor. It's the honor of a lifetime, really, to be able to mix all this stuff together successfully. So I just want to say down below, we have a comment from Tony Rotunda, who's my partner here in the museum. She's saying, beautiful conversation. So happy you were all here. And uh, thanks for making it possible for us all to be here, Tony. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. And then, yeah. And uh, then we have another comment here by Cute Rich 772 who um, well, Rich. she helps me on uh, Saturdays here at the museum. And she says, there's also courage required in allowing other people to view your art, which is yeah. so personal. We, uh, you've all done that, and we're all very grateful that you've shared your work. And I got to say, yeah, I think um, uh, people love all of your work. Daniel's disappeared here, but people really like to bug out on that piece there. And, and uh, I don't know, it's really an honor to be able to share stuff. We've shared a lot of Barry's work here over the last couple of years. And uh, thank you very much, Barry. And if you want to share what you have there, that'd be awesome. Um, it's, uh, people bug out on your work. It's fantastic. And Alexis, you're brand new, Josh, you're brand new, but I'm sure in a couple of years, I'll be talking about how, uh, people have been bugging out on your work here for a long time. So it's, uh, it's, it's as somebody that sits there every day and I deal with the people actually looking at the stuff. It is so much fun to see what people get drawn to. It is such a blast to hear people's comments where people can either just be like, I don't know why this is cool, to, oh, wow, I'm so glad that I drove four hours to look at this thing. I only have an hour and a half, and I you can't drag me away from it, which is, um, you know, that's like really rewarding. Really? You know, it's... Uh, to, have, to have someone be engaged. Work, yeah. not, not afraid of it. Maybe, you know, have some trepidation coming up as they approach it. But then be immersed in it and um, ask the right questions and uh, interact with it and uh, let it somehow perpetuate their intellectual and emotional curiosity. Allow themselves to be vulnerable to it and uh, walk away enriched, ultimately a better person. It's a, it's really an honor to be able to share that kind of experience with people. So thank you very much, all of you, for uh, giving us the opportunity to do it. Because thank you. I know oh, yes. Off the show, I just sit there and be like, "Well, we got a blank wall. I don't know. Do you do art? Oh, okay. You have an Instagram? I guess I don't know." So it's nice to be able to share world class art in my very punk rock DIY museum here in Cleveland, Ohio. Well, we love it and we appreciate it. You know, it's, so, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great location, Stephen. It really is. It's a great location. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, your show that we had here last year. Was, was that last year or was that earlier this year? No, it was early 2020, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, 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 I think so. January, yeah. February 2020, yeah. Time means nothing anymore. I guess it didn't really mean anything before, but now it's like... <laughs> it didn't mean anything before, you're right. I knew it was pre-COVID days. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Thank you all for uh, taking the time, and thank you... Uh, especially for making the effort to try to put into words the ineffable. It's, um, for me, I always, you know, I try and make a, I sometimes make a blunder and uh, sometimes I sound like English is my second language when I try and talk about this. And you guys have all been so articulate. And so, uh, careful. Well, I thought, I thought you had a baby. You had a baby? You didn't tell me. Not me. It's, it's my son. He, he just woke up. Oh, no. Remember those days. I'm going to switch yeah, the, the, the microphone. I, I think it's kind of interesting. I was just sort of thinking about, um, 
I think, it, you know, the alchemical metaphor of like um, taking the dross or the lead and transmuting it into the philosopher's stone metaphorically as the creation is um, probably a good kind of bridge between the artistic predicament and what Stephen's talking about, the transformative or uh, quality of the art. And, um, you know, and I think that's essentially kind of like, a, a you know, an analogous occult process of, of, um, of creating, especially with the sort of um, subject, subject matter or the subjective experience of um, the artistic process in relationship to esoteric um, matters as well, you know. So, yeah, it, it, it is, um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's that ability to transmute um, that stuff and uh, present it. And I think another point that's really, I think, uh, Stephen was talking about, um, and I think which is really important at the moment, and I think that that esoteric process is, 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 is so incredibly unique to an individual that it can't, it, you know, by definition it is authentic or it has, it has the width of authenticity or, it, you know, it is it, it, because it's, it, it's, you know, to the core or the quick of the, of the person, you know, and, um, and I think people need that now. Whereas before, I mean, we've gone past the, uh, you know, the death of the author and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, like a, the postmodernist sort of deconstruction of like, Art, you know, privileged point of art, art, artist as uh, creator, and it really sort of it's it's a different sort of um, configuration. But I think that um, especially in these times, I think people want to people people want they want to they want a whiff of authenticity again because you can't fucking believe anything you fucking <laughs> see on the television. You don't know it's a it's an incredibly discombobulating and uh, you know postmodern predicament really. But I think that's something. And I think that's, and I think it's being mirrored. And I think that's why there's an interest in, uh, you know, different modes of, and, and different things like that. Because I think people want to feel like they can believe in something or not necessarily believe in something, be certain of something or being able to sort of resonate with their authentic self and go, you know, turn on a couple. Of, so if the creative process of the artist kind of, you know, lights up a couple of bulbs on the Christmas tree that's been long out, then that's a that's a kind of a noble endeavor. Yeah, it's uh, and I'm the one that gets to actually see it. So it's uh. Well, also I think uh, I, I think people in general are looking more toward the esoteric realm for answers right now. So, so I, I think that that is on kind of a large level. You know, I I, I think that I've seen. You know, more people that I know grab their first tarot back than ever. Yeah. Um, you know, and um, but, you know, and, and that's you know, even even as like a gateway to uh, a gateway drug to our world. But you know, you know, or even I see it through my students again, like you know, asking me for asking me for research. You know, like, oh, can I, you know, we talked about a, a grimoire from the 1700s. Can I have it? Can I borrow it? And, you know, it's, it's, it's this, like, there's a searching that's going on now, a need of answers. Um, and, and perhaps that's part of, because of part, in part, because of the turmoil that we're dealing with collectively. You know, I think that um, sometimes I, I remember reading a review from the uh, Language of the Birds show in New York at the Gray Gallery that was put on by, um, uh, goodness gracious, how did I forget her name, Pam, Pam Grosman. And, um, you know, there was this uh, review that said, oh, you know, like, uh, you know, was talking about, you know, um, the lines getting into the gallery and how they had to wait with all these young people to get into the gallery. But it sort of said, you know, in uh, uncertain times, you know, people collapse into mystical mumbo jumbo. And I was like, you know what, man, you really missed the point. It's not like that people turn to those types of things to kind of, you know, um, for some sort of uh, solace or some type of kind of, you know, like, uh, you know, what, what it says in the astrology to make meaning of, uh, you know, it's a little bit, uh, it's a different than that. And I think you really kind of missed the point. But, I mean, the, you know, you'll get that sort of idea sort of, you know, and that sort of really reeks of the, uh, you know, kind of like uh, the materialist kind of canon of that sort of goes along with Western art, sort of like, oh, well, these people were just kind of like, uh, 
pukes or crap pops or something like that. But when the artist speaks to people and they don't really know why it does, it's not because they're looking for a safe place to be or like, you know, like some type of like, uh, you know, uh, uh, something to kind of, you know, try and feel comfortable. I mean, it's, it's sort of different than that. And uh, so I don't think that people are turning to, you know, the tarot or astrology because they're uncertain. They may be looking for answers, but I think it's a little bit, different than sort of like a crutch you know what i mean i don't know if i'm well, explaining myself um i agree a hundred percent i think it's the opposite i think it's 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 what we were all talking about before about daring to go a little further and look further and i don't think it it's all about the kind of crackpot stuff i think it's going okay i'm gonna look a little further than i'm used to looking and that is a huge thing on a day, in a person's life. You know, even in a even on a normal day, you go you go to work, you go home, watch TV, whatever you do. And if you go, wait a second, I want to understand something about the world that I've never seen before. And that's you know, I, I agree. I, I think it's I think it's not. It, it, sorry, I think it's much more. It can be much more deep. And that's that is where the artists. Um, uh, where, where we present the doorways because we're show, we're, we're, we're going through this. We're looking, we're pulling back the veil. You're pulling back the veil. Yeah. We're pulling back the veil. Yeah. Exactly. And, 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 and it's penetrating. Yeah. Uh, whatever you want to call it, into the divine being, to the order of the cosmos. There's so many different ways of putting it. Right. Yeah. But that's what that's what the artist is doing. It's like walking into a dark room and letting your eyes adjust, and then opening your eyes wider and wider until your third eye opens, right? And Carrie, <laughs> 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 I see Barry's third eye is already open. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Mine's like <laughs> working on it. What you're seeing, right? You're processing what you're seeing into something quantifiable that somehow someone else is going to come along and experience that. It's like the, what do you call it? Like the, the, those tantric paintings that the Tibetan monks make, you know? Like, yeah. Well, well, yeah, it could, it could also be Baudelaire's derangement of the senses to get a new perspective, you know? <laughs> well, I like to force synesthesia personally, so. <laughs> That's why I'll get along. <laughs> yeah, I, I I love it. I'm so happy to be able to have shown with everyone here, by the way. Can we do this again? Can we do more? <laughs> All right. Four person show coming up. <laughs> Steven. So yeah. Um it's uh I'm, I'm thinking about what Barry was saying, talking about that review, and it's like, this stuff never goes away. Maybe it ebbs and flows, but I don't think that you could really be an artist, even of the most banal type, and not be drawing from something cosmic and something from the, um, the other. You know, I, I always think about that. Somebody was in here one day recently, and they are like, well, what are you going to do when nobody likes witchcraft anymore? And I'm like, it's not going to be like 5,000 years from now. You know, you can't stop witchcraft. This is like deep in everyone's heart and mind, you know? it's. Uh, but do you ever get persecuted for what you do, for what you present? Yeah. Not. Uh, the people that do try to hassle me do it as such a just pathetic kind of <laughs> manner that it's not even fun to like really think about it. I have a stalker. I haven't seen him in a while. Probably every time I say that I have him, he shows up. But we had some we had some people on Halloween that were yelling. He got really bored, wandered away. You know, it's uh I always think, you know, I won, you lost, you know, just go away, you know, accept your defeat, <laughs> you know, it's over, it's done, go, uh, go away, it's, uh, I mean, yeah, but, 
but uh, <laughs> I don't know. So Elias says, so Elias, uh, he reads here, uh, um, Stephen does have one friend who shows up in the warmer weather. Um, yeah. Yeah, stalkers. Um, anyway, I gotta say this has been a wonderful conversation with you guys. Um, from all of you, we have people from Portugal, Australia, Oklahoma, two Brooklynites, and I'm in old Brooklyn here. Who knew that we'd all get together today? Um, I don't know. You guys have anything to add? Because uh, I think I think this is a nice place to wrap it up. Wrap it up. Thank you. I think we should do this more often. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. It's kind of fun to hang out, right? <laughs> and I think everybody agrees with that. Everybody, the magnificent weapon, dialogue, and knowledge is. Um, you can't beat that in terms of uh, going out into the world and having a position and being able to stick to it and knowing you have allies. You know, yeah. who, uh, are like-minded and whose uh, activity perpetuates your activity. We all support one another. We're like the placenta, you know. It's like we're the <laughs> we're the strength of the community, right? You'll have to make the you know placenta prince, you know, like. Yeah, I love how graphic that was. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was. The then we really will get accused of witchcraft. <laughs> no, don't look at my potions. <laughs> so I do want to say that Kara made a comment here and she says mostly people love it all lol and uh, that's so true it's no, no, uh, no, no, it's just cute witches who's this person with cute witch? she's Kara she's here on Saturdays oh. come visit but Kara it, when asked about her screen name she says it's because I'm cute AF and uh, okay. so Kara makes a really wonderful point, though. Mostly people love it all. People come here, see the museum, have a wonderful time. And uh, we can't do it without all of you. So we have Daniel Harms here, and he says, thank you very much to the hosts and speakers. Thank you, Daniel. I was thinking about you the other day. I saw one of your books, the Conjurman books, show up. Um, I think Treadwell's posted about having a copy of it. And I got to admit, I got super jealous. And also, uh, well, I was thinking about some of your investigations that you've done recently about something, and I was like, hmm, I should probably talk to Daniel. So if you're out driving those long distances and want to stop at the Buckland sometimes, do soon, please do, because, you know, we got some things to talk about. <laughs> All right, well, so I'm just going to. Go across and say, Daniel, thank you very much. Your art is incredible. I look at this stuff and I see the secret geometry of the world. I see some Paul Paul Laff, Laffrey, right? Is that the guy's name? Laffaway? Laffaway. I see some of that, but I see yeah, some of that. That stuff's incredible. Thank you. And then Alexis. Look at this stuff. It's incredible. It's mind-blowing. Thank you very Thanks. much. Josh, I love this stuff, you guys, so much. I hope to see the real thing someday. Barry, what can I say? You're, uh, you're an inspiration. I see truly the depths and the mysteries of the cosmos in your art. Steven Romano, thank you so much for loaning this stuff to me. It's... Um, this is all stuff from Steven's personal collection here, which is uh, really, um, if you've never been in Steven Romano's uh, living room before and have him done his personal art show for you, you're, you're missing out. It, uh, it's it's mind-boggling fun. And then to everybody that's watching here, I just want to say thank you so much. Oh, Romano. Oh, no, yeah. never mind. We'll save it for another time. So everyone that's watching here, I just want to say thank you so much for tuning in. And, uh, you know, oh, uh, next Monday at 7 p.m., I think, Eastern Standard Time, I'm going to be speaking with uh, Jason Mankey about his Yule book. So that's going to be a lot of fun.
probably talk about like Krampus and all sorts of stuff like that because I know that uh, Jason is really quite the devotee of the horned god. So anyway, I hope everyone um, has fun until then. And you know, what I always say, stay witchy, my friends. Yeah.